Bro. Hey guys, this is Lisa Mendig. I played Bill Murray's mother in Scrooge, Carol on Seinfeld, and you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. Hey Tommy, you gotta see the baby! Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming very talented character actress, and I am talking about Mary Stein, who played Miss Ruhu in the 2000 Jim Carrey, Ron Howard adaptation of Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas, celebrating its 20th anniversary. I'm so excited to have her on today. She's had a pretty interesting career. She was also in Woody Allen's movie Alice, where she played a nun. She guest starred in Star Trek Next Generation. She was a landlady in Babe Pig of the City. Um, she was in Men in Black 2. Lots of good stuff. And I love talking to journeyman character actors. It's going to be great to have her on today. And I am so excited. And uh, today is my brother's birthday. Happy, happy birthday, Joe. And it's going to be a good show today. We're just days away from... Oh, and it's also um, Jane Fonda's birthday, too. Happy birthday, Barbarilla. We are just days away from Christmas, and even though we're all shut in, locked in during COVID, it should be a Merry Christmas because all we have is each other at the end of the day, and we got to be counting our blessings and being grateful for what we got. So yeah, here is my interview with Mary Stein. Tommy. Hey, Mary. Welcome to the show. How are you today? Quite fine, thank you. How are you? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. The sun's out, so I can't complain. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. I'm taking a little Christmas vacation, so I'm excited about that. That's good. That's good. I hope you're staying safe over there. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, it's just down to St. George Island. I'm, um, you know, I live in Atlanta right now, so... Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's it's nice down here. Yeah. Nice. That's where they're all that's where everyone's shooting movies now and stuff is in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, a lot of movies and TV. It's it's kind of amazing. I mean, I lived in LA for like 25 years and mm-hmm. I also lived in New York for 10. And um it's just amazing that luckily I landed here by happenstance and um it seems to be a really great place to be at the moment <laughs> so, with everything going on and it's really busy for me so it's good that's wonderful this is such a great honor thank you for taking the time today oh yeah. i'm thrilled thank you for inviting me absolutely so going back in time did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood yeah there was well actually initially i wanted to be a uh, dancer my neighbors were dancers and mm. um we choreographed and did all sorts of numbers um, in, well, in the neighborhood, but also entered competitions and that sort of thing. And um, then in junior high school and high school, I was involved with theater. And um, it just, I, was, I won awards and things, and <laughs> it was just something that came really easy to me. And yeah. um, so th- I just sort of naturally was like, well, I guess this is what I'm going to do. So. <laughs> uh, you're born in Michigan and raised in Wisconsin? Uh, upper Michigan, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice, nice. So you graduated from Marquette and then went to Juilliard, and uh, some of your classmates were Kevin Spacey, Val Kilmer, Thomas Gibson. Anybody else that uh, the, the, the public may not uh, know? Oh, um, yeah, Linda Kozlowski, who was in the um, Crocodile Dundee movies and oh, ended yeah. up carrying, um, Crocodile Dundee. Um, let's see. Oh, her name is Kelly McGillis, was a class ahead of me. Mm-hmm. Um, Bradley Whitford was a class behind me. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just tons of amazing people that um, were there around the time that I was there and, and continue, you know, I mean, it continues to be a place that, um, you know, amazing people come out of, well, I mean, 
it's not just that the training is awesome. They pick really amazing people. So yeah. the people going in are already talented. I mean, I just think of people like Robin Williams who went there or yeah. Christopher Reeves yeah. or, <laughs> you know, some of these people or um, I think William Hurt. Um, I think he got kicked out. A bunch of people got kicked out, but they, you know, like William Hurt did and um, uh, what's his name? He was, well, anyway, I don't need to go into everybody that was, but um, <laughs> a lot of people that ended up not continuing, you know, they were just such immense talents that um, regardless, they, you know, did incredibly well. So, but the training is also amazing. It definitely um, expands possibilities. Mm -hmm. It certainly does. So um, you said you were in New York for 10 years. Um, did you do yep. uh, any Broadway? Um, I did off-Broadway. I did a play um, off-Broadway, the same play a couple times, uh, called Traps. It was a Carol Churchill play mm -hmm. that um, John Sticks directed. And, um, yeah, and mainly when I was in New York, I did a lot of TV commercials and um, then ended up moving to L.A., what kind of uh, products did you endorse? Uh, oh, oh my God! I did <laughs> so many commercials. I don't even know where to begin. I mean, I did. Um, let's see, um, Sepacol. I remember doing Sepacol and um, uh, New York Lottery and um, Kellogg's. Oh, what was that Kellogg's? That was a big one. It was probably Special K or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've done, I did one for Minolta, where I was putting a um, paper tray into a, a, a um, you know, printer, and uh, it was like one of these old-fashioned printers, and I was like leaning over it, and I literally fell over doing it, and mm -hmm. that wasn't really part of the commercial that they kept it in, because it was so funny. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just I've just done like hundreds over the years. And um, I actually just did a commercial for Geico. Um, nice. In oh. November, it hasn't come out yet, so, yeah. No, I'll be looking forward to seeing that. Those Geico commercials are hilarious. Yeah, it is pretty funny, but it definitely is going to be a good one. Um, I haven't been doing as many commercials in the last decade or so. I've been mainly doing TV and film and that sort of thing, and then writing some. and Yeah. yeah. A lot of actors I talk to, they're embarrassed about a lot of the stuff they've endorsed because it's so unhealthy, like fast food or soda or alcohol or something. <laughs> uh, you know? Yeah, you know, the only thing that I don't endorse is, um, I, mean, I think when I, like the height of my uh, commercial business, you know, where I was doing so many, um, I did do some, like I think I did McDonald's and... Um, I mean, I did a ton of fast food commercials and um, sort of crazy things, but um, I don't think I was as, um, I was just grateful for the work at that time. I think as I matured, mm -hmm. people, the main thing that I wouldn't really endorse, endorse is pharmaceutical products I, because I'm naturopathic, so I don't mm -hmm. tend to do those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So your first movie listed on IMDb was Woody Allen's Alice. Oh, yeah. Is that, is that on the IMDb? Okay. Yeah. yeah, that was, wow, that was when I was in New York. And I'm, I don't even think it made it into the film, but I worked with Woody Allen and I played a nun. It was a very strange experience. He, like, didn't direct directly. He was, like, behind this. Yeah. And you can, you know, it was just an odd experience. So, I've heard. Um, I don't remember it that much more. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he puts everything, you know, in, in the actor's hands, you know, because he figures, he, you know, they have talent. That's why he hired them. And, you know, that's, that, yeah. that, that's how he directs. Yeah. I guess. I mean, that's a Clint Eastwood thing, too. However, I mean, when I worked with Clint Eastwood, he gave probably the best direction that I've ever been given and uh, the most fun direction which was cool but yeah I mean I don't remember I, like I was just a 
date. That was probably the first thing I ever did. And um, it was intense. I, I remember being really nervous, and I really wanted to work with him. But, um, yeah, I had no, no real contact with him, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Then you uh, you played a alien nurse on Star Trek: The Next Generation. Yeah, that was special. That was really fun. Um, that was with um, I think Whoopi Goldberg was in that episode, yes. and um, Picard. He was great. I just loved working with him. Patrick Stewart. Yeah, that was fun. He he actually helped me a, a lot. I can't remember. I think it was they they ended up. You know, a lot of times when you're in these things, they they sort of overwrite the characters, and then they ended up editing a lot of the dialogue, and all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, you know, I said to him, <laughs> uh, where's the character? They just took the character away. And he goes, you just condense it into those small, you know what I mean? Make it yeah. into the small, the few lines that are still there, you just condense it into that, and he was so helpful, and um, you don't always experience that on set, but he was such a sweet man, and um, made the scene really work well, so, yeah. yeah. And that I, was also one of, that was, that was, that I think was the first or second thing that I did, I think the first thing that I did was um, Murphy Brown. Mm-hmm. Then you did a, a movie called Man of the Year. Uh, Dirk Schaefer, uh, was he a friend of yours? No, not really. I mean, um, what happened is somebody from Murphy Brown, mm -hmm. um, that was, it was that episode, um, I think it was called Political Correctness, and it was, we were in a town hall meeting, and somebody else in the town hall um, referred me to him. And they had gone through all the groundlings, tried to cast, his girlfriend, who I guess the film is about um, him coming out as gay because he had been sort of a centerfold for different sort of Playboy magazines, but, you know, and um, was kind of this GQ icon. And, um, but he was gay, and so um, it's sort of a mockumentary on that. And mm -hmm. I, they had tried to cast that role with um, all these Groundlings people and mm -hmm. they didn't find it believable and then I was referred to him and I went over to, you know, the audition was at his place in West Hollywood, Dirk's place and um, I think they filmed it but he gave it to me right, like on the spot, he just gave it to me and I, <laughs> <laughs> I just remember, I mean, like I was a kid, right? Yeah. I just remember, I said, I said, are you sure? You don't want to see anybody. Are you sure? <laughs> like, just like that? And he goes, uh-huh. And, um, I mean, I understand why <laughs> now, because, you know, like my comedy, I'm more, um, I don't play for comedy. I play, uh, my training is as an actor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I play a character in situation and, um, with high stakes that's kind of it and that makes it funny so I tend towards sort of dramedy type things and so I think it worked really well I mean I'm proud of my work in that film I was embarrassed when I first saw it I mean when I saw the screening I was just embarrassed because I found um hmm. it was so close to the bone and a lot of my idiosyncrasies were in there and I just was this was the first time I saw myself on the big screen and I just was like Ah, uh, but you. It was, it, was it was hard to take, but but now I'm proud of it. So. Yeah, I mean, you have cute idiosyncrasies, so don't sell yourself short. <laughs> no, no, I, but that's not it. It's mm -hmm. just um, because they worked, and ultimately, what you want when you're playing any character is you want them to be very idiosyncratic, so that they they just have that sort of immediate, identifiable, like they're multidimensional, they're a real human being, they have a lot of really specific behavior. And so I did that, and that's why now I'm proud of it. However, at the time, I felt really naked. I just felt really revealed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was just such an innocent. And um, But anyway, so, <laughs> all in the past. <laughs> so, 
I do remember just being like, oh my God. <laughs> I want to see anybody for like a few days. I just was like, yeah, I just won't make it. But anyway, it's all good because that's ultimately what you want to do is be that out there. So. Yeah, you mentioned the the groundlings. Yeah, Cynthia Zaghetti, uh, who passed away a few years ago, uh, her best friend from high school, who formed the groundlings with her, is actually a very close friend of mine. I'm actually talking. Yeah, I'm actually talking to her privately tomorrow. Um, yeah, she was a genius, Cynthia Zaghetti. Oh, who, who are you referring to? The heavy set Italian woman. Uh, oh, who's, I know Cynthia. Cynthia was actually in Man of the Year. Actually, that's what I mean. Yeah. Her, and I studied with her too. So yeah. Oh, so you 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 got her her narrative right away of you know just how tough she could be on students and all that. No, I was in, in class with her for a number of years and was a friend of hers. I knew her pretty well. But who's the friend of hers that you're? Oh, about? I bet I. Oh. What? Oh, uh, her name's Terry Bolo. Oh, okay. No, I don't know her. Yeah, she's uh, she's like the queen of like bit parts in like seventies and eighties movies. Um, her most notable ones, uh, she was one of the mean girls in in the original Carrie, and uh, she she was the the little blonde haired biker chick in Pee Wee's Big Adventure. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know her, but wow. Yeah, she's a wonderful lady. Uh, I remember when you uh, were in Dead Man on Campus. That's such a weird movie. <laughs> Kind of day player. Yeah, that was just that little bit um, at the, I guess it was orientation or something. I yeah. didn't really know, uh, you know, I just kind of came in and did my thing and left. I didn't really know the players all that much. Yeah, and that was really early on too. So. Yeah. How about uh, when you played the landlady in Babe Pig in the City? Mm. What do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> How was that experience? Well, that was, I mean, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, that was an extraordinary experience, uh, life-changing. I mean, that took my career in some ways potentially to a new level, although um, the film itself didn't do as as well as the first one. A lot of the, um, you know, the fans of the first one were wanted it to be more like the first one and they kind of departed but that was an incredible odyssey i mean i did not even know really when i auditioned for that initially i didn't really and and luckily i didn't really know um much about the film itself like the first film Mm -hmm. or um anything really so i was just taking the script at face value and just you know, working really hard on um, delivering. And um, <laughs> I remember <laughs> leaving the audition, and I um, had a coach at the time, and, and we really worked with the melody. And, uh, you know, we do this thing where you um, find the pause, the meaningful pause before we're it. Anyway, so we worked really hard on that. And, um, I just remember, she let me do it a couple times, and I remember thinking, I mean, I I didn't, I did a good job, but I didn't nail it to the extent that I wanted to. And um, and I just went to my car, and I just thought, oh, my God, what's it going to take, you know? Mm-hmm. And whatever. Anyway, a couple, uh, I really didn't think I got it because I hadn't nailed it to the extent that I wanted. And... Um, But I think about a couple weeks later, my agent called me, and I was at home writing one afternoon, and um, she just said, sit down. Um, You are the first choice for this role of the landlady, and you're up against Lily Tomlin and Daryl Hannah. And I just thought, this is a joke. The universe is torturing me. Like, there's no way they're going to... You know, but I mm-hmm. ended up getting it. You know, um, they came and there was a call back in. I guess their initial audition was in May, and they came back in July and up from Australia, and um, you know, just had an interview and an audition, and read some more sides, and then I was cast. And a couple weeks later, I was in Australia. 
So, I mean, that was huge. And I got to work with Mickey Rooney and um, Magda Zubansky and amazing animals, Charlie the Monkey and um, George Miller was the director. Yeah. And um, I got to live in Sydney, Australia, and um, for a long time <laughs> because um, when you're working with animals, they're very slow at getting what they want. And um, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I was down there a long time, and then when we would come on the set, they would be so grateful because we, you know, nail it after a few takes. But um, yeah, the animals were were arduous. You know, I mean, they had multiple backup animals. If one wasn't behaving, they'd bring in another. But um, and I became close with the animal trainers and um, got to know Australia, and yeah, it was. Ex- I mean, honestly, it was just an extraordinary experience. I bought a lot of hats because they dyed my <laughs> hair. Um, not really black, but very dark brown and gave me this sort of bob with bangs and I felt like a little boy and yeah. I, <laughs> I was a bit embarrassed. So I would go to these markets and buy hats and I became like the hat lady. Mm-hmm. Just these beautiful sort of English hats because they're sort of got that Euro flair down there. But um, yeah, it was really an extraordinary experience and um yeah, it's, it's crazy how George Miller goes from directing edgy stuff like the Mad Max movies and uh, the Witches of Eastwick to directing something family-friendly like Babe, you know, it's just, it's well, so weird. Well, I mean, I think that's what changed the flavor of it, because the, I think the guy's name that directed the first one was Chris Noonan. Right, Chris, Chris Noonan. And, um, yeah, so he just had a different feel, and then... Um, I think George was, I'm not sure if he was actually a writer on it, but I'm sure he was involved with the writing of it. Um, he had a team of writers, and of all people, um, Kate Blanchett's husband was a writer on it, Andrew, and, um, and she would come to the set sometimes, but that was before she had sort of blown up and stuff, but um, yeah, so I got to know him. He was working on that. He was a very sweet man. Um, but yeah, so I think that's why it's a bit more edgy is, um, because, you know, George Miller has that bit of an edge, that dark. Right. He sure does. You know, a lot of kids stuff has, I mean, and even the first one had, there is a bit of an edge, but you have to, I think with kids stuff, it's a fine line. You know, you need that sort of dark side. Otherwise it's like Barney or something. Oh yeah. It doesn't have any dimension, (laughs) but, um, no offense to Barney, but it's just a different thing, you know? Yeah, exactly. Now, can you believe it's been 20 years since How the Grinch Stole Christmas? Right? I mean, just, how, where does the time go? It's just so crazy. But, um, yeah, I, I now that, I also, I loved, uh, I loved Dr. Seuss so much. Me too. That, um, and in particular, I loved How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Like every year, I would watch that. I so felt like a who. And um, <laughs> I mean, I just feel like that person that, you know, I don't know, it just warms my heart. And um, so when I had the opportunity to audition for that, um, yeah, I just, I had a lot, definitely, what's the word for it? My heels were dug in, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I was all over that. And, um, I mean, luckily I got called in. I don't um, remember how that happened exactly. Um, I guess my agent, you know, set that up. It probably was on the heels, I think it was on the heels of uh, Babe Pig in the City. And, um, yeah, so I remember having a meeting with Ron Howard, <laughs> and... Um, I wore one of my hats from Australia, yeah. a blue hat, and I wore this blue trench coat, you know, like, <laughs> and I just, you know, I was so, everything I did around that whole experience, there was a lot of um, preparation, a lot of um, research, and like even before the interview with Ron Howard, I had read interviews with him you know, to get to know him, and um, he, I remember one of the things he said in his, um, one of his interviews with uh, his casting director 
at that time. I can't remember their name now, but um, yeah, it, um, he said in the interview, he said, when, wh- oh, the interviewer said, why do you interview people or what are you looking for when you interview people? And he goes, I want to see, it, I, I want to know if I can see eye to eye with them on the mm-hmm. character. And so I just took that literally, sort of. And I just <laughs> was like, looked him straight in the eyes. I was just like <laughs> constantly, like all about the eye contact and about total, like being present and, you know, transparent. Yeah. And also embodying the sort of, you know, whatever. I dressed like, <laughs> like a who, basically, <laughs> in, in my mind, you know, this, this sort of beautiful blue coat with the blue hat. That was my attempt to be the whimsical sort of cool who. Um, but, um, yeah, and I remember sitting in the lobby up at Imagine and the amazing other people that were auditioning for that. Um, a lot of uh, Groundlings people, too. Oh, yeah, I've, I've, inter- I've interviewed Mindy Sterling. Yes, Mindy Sterling's a good friend of mine for many years. And, um, yeah, she was there and she ended up playing uh, one of the characters in The Grinch, too. So, yeah, so that was cool. And then then um, I remember getting, um, oh, we had, we were, they actually didn't know, they, they hired us to be Who's, but they didn't know, they didn't have the script yet, they said. So we were going to be Who's in Whoville, and they didn't know what yet. And then they had um, us come in and um, had Rick Baker create um, makeup for us. Like, uh, you know, they had to create the sort of sculpture that they would create the makeup on. So they had to do, like, cast your head and um, went in for that. And um, it's funny because I, I had been, in the meantime, since they didn't know who my character was, I created one with my coach. <laughs> we created... <laughs> a Whoville school teacher and um, created a whole backstory and also I had a whole monologue um, that I had created and so interesting when I showed up for the, to have my head cast Rick Baker showed me the, that they had a Whoville school teacher um, created already for you know um, but it hadn't been cast yet and he showed me the makeup for it and he said I actually made this for you. So there was a lot of synchronicity. And um, and then they had the, um, what do you call it, the screen test. And so the screen test was with me with the Whoville school teacher makeup on. And I was already, like, I had the character. I had, you know, um, a monologue. And I, I was really just embodying the character. I ended up getting that character. So... Um, yeah, that was fun. It was a really challenging shoot because, um, well, there were tons and tons of people, so that's always going to be um, yeah. you know, just a lot of scheduling and this and that. But also the makeup take, well, my makeup and hair, because I had the, um, the um, wig, the Who wig, and that took four and a half hours. Wow. I had to get there 4 a.m. and then um, we were called to the set around eight ish, and um, and then at the end of the day, it took about an hour and fifteen minutes to take it off. So you became very close with your your um, the other who's and also the makeup people. <laughs> <laughs> You're spending a lot of time with them. So, um, but yeah, that was an extraordinary experience, and um, and I remember. Um, one funny thing that happened um, was um, there was a scene with um, Jim Carrey and um, Jeffrey Tambor yeah. where they were having a fight in the town square and it was the last scene, the last hour of the last day. I think Jim must have, you know, asked them if they had already gotten what they needed. And what happened is this fight just escalated to this, like, totally sort of frantic level and there there were nose to nose and Jim bit Jeffrey Tambor's prosthetic nose off. <laughs> <laughs> and he was sitting he was standing there without a nose. I mean obviously he didn't expect it, but it was like 
you know, the guys behind the camera were expecting it. It was hilarious. But anyway, he was sort of with his drawers down all of a sudden. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> his face was ripped off by Jim Carrey. Um, so, and I would say the other thing that I remember is what Jim Carrey had to, and this is more like anecdotal um, through the makeup people. Yeah. Because I, I also worked with Kazu a, a lot. Um, and he, he actually initially created my makeup. Um, but then he was changed over to Jim to work with Jim. But he said that Jim Carrey had to work with Navy SEALs because the amount of wearing that makeup for that many hours, because his was even more intense, and then that whole bodysuit, and then he had the contact lenses, and um, it was it was potentially torturous. And so he was trained by Navy SEALs how to <laughs> withstand torture. Mm-hmm. And his performance, in my estimation, I was amazed, because I almost thought it was sort of almost Shakespearean, in that his command of language and his voice and his body and the music of it, I just thought, like, you know, and to think that he was that uncomfortable, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Under the, that kind of duress, and that guy pulled that out of, I, I mean, my hat's off to that guy in terms of what he did in that film. It blew yeah. me away. Was, was Rick Baker your makeup guy? Yes. Because uh-huh. well, well, he's the guy that and I think he designed. I don't know if he designed all the makeups or. Uh, um, I mean, I definitely worked with him. I mean, and after that, Rick liked my um, look a lot, my mm-hmm. long neck and just sort of my features, and so he was always trying to put me in things, you know. Yeah. Um, with prosthetics, um, I'm sure. Well, because he just he's an artist. And he just sort of gravitated towards, he just had, I like, Fred, he put me in um, Men in Black 2 with another kid that was in The Grinch, and he made us bird aliens. Mm-hmm. And the makeup, um, Kazu actually did that makeup on me in that, and um, was absolutely extraordinary. Um, I did sort of put a little time limit on, like, after The Grinch, I was like, um, Hey, I'm happy to do you know anything you want, but yeah. um, maybe a week or two is the limit. Because I mean, like the Grinch was like <laughs> you know, five to six months without stuff. I mean, I can't even imagine these guys that do um, The Walking Dead and some of these characters that wear prosthetics all the time. And I, and actually, going back to um, Next Generation, I in that didn't even have to wear prosthetics. That was amazing. <laughs> you know, I didn't get into the prosthetics until later. But, um, yeah. but anyway, so, um, yeah, so he would put me in things. He put me in Haunted Mansion. Also, I played an old old granny in Haunted Mansion. And, um, yeah, I mean, just little bits. He just liked creating cool characters. Yeah, because Rick Baker, he wrote a book last year, and he did a lot of interviews to promote it. And he said that uh, this, this movie was the... Um, the, uh, the the last straw that broke the camel's back for him uh, working in the industry because this was the beginning of him seeing, you know, the corporate takeover of the studios, you know, and they wanted him to, do, to, to they, they didn't want Jim Carrey to look like the Grinch. They wanted him to look like Jim Carrey, but with a green face, you know, and Rick Baker... <laughs> Yes, <clears throat> and Rick Baker told the studio, he said, this movie is not called How Jim Carrey Stole Christmas, it's called How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And he, he went in, he got into a long argument about it, you know, Ron Howard got in the middle of it because he wanted Rick more than anybody, and, you know, it eventually got compromised and everything, but he said this was the, the final straw, and he did maybe three more projects after this and then retired. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and those projects, two of them I was in. I yeah. Think, and he, yeah. Well, I, I know it was. It, you know, it does get very difficult at times when the studios get involved and you get all the, um, oh, I don't know, all these people, and there are too many cooks in the kitchen. You know. Yeah. And then also, <laughs> it's like it's interesting because I've gone up religiously when I was in LA and now you don't really need to because there's so much online. But mm-hmm. I used to always go to Beyond Baroque. Not beyond Baroque. Well, I went there too, but it's called Beyond Words. It's a it's a um, 
it's an event. It's an Oscar event every year at um, the Writers Guild, yeah. and um, so they have all the Oscar or the Oscar nominated writers come, and then they have like an amazing um, celebrity host that asks some questions and interviews them. And I would say, you know, after going there for years and listening to these fantastic artists and writers who pulled off such amazing work under you know, in the system, Mm -hmm. some of them outside the system, but the thread, the common thread that I could see is that they kept artistic control. They found a way to keep artistic control because um, if you you can just, it can just become, you know, a patchwork quilt. (laughs) (laughs) If if you don't have um, some sort of guiding um, artistic vision that that keeps it whole, and um, and that is they found a way, one way or another. Um, I would say consistently that is like the base class of all those writers uh, over all the years that I've listened to them being interviewed. That is a common thread to me yeah. that I, I observed. So um, yeah, so it's frustrating to um, artists um, if they can't and they fight hard especially somebody like rick baker i oh, mean yeah. yeah and he was right i oh. mean i don't think that i didn't really observe that the grinch looked particularly like jim carrey did he i think it, he i think he looked exactly like the original grinch um, yeah, that's what I thought. But they they wanted him just to have a green face, so we could see that as Jim Carrey because he was such a hot commodity, you know. And well, I wonder if they wanted did they want that or did he want that? Because there was a little bit of friction around the whole <clears throat> makeup thing with him. I mean, I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but. Um, mm-hmm. May, he may have had something to do with that too. Uh, he maybe. may have not wanted to wear all that makeup because it was excruciating. But I don't ultimately know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. But I remember when I first saw the trailer, I was expecting it to be like a Tim Burton movie because it was so dark. When I saw that it was Ron Howard, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. And then I found out Tim Burton actually turned down to direct the movie. Oh my God! Thank goodness, right? In a way, or no? <laughs> I, I think like, he, I think he could have done just as good, you know. But um, yeah. he's he's gone into overkill. Tim Burton with the remakes. He did the Alice in Wonderland one, and he did the Dumbo one. You know, I think he needs to like kind of take a step back and get back to being artistic, like he did. You know, like he was before. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think I did see the Alice in Wonderland. Is that with Johnny Depp? Yes, because he, he puts Depp in everything he does now. And I love that. Yeah. Well, Depp is such a great match with him. They just work so well together. I mean, I understand that. I don't know. I guess I haven't tracked his his uh, later work. I did, I did do a film at the same time that I did The Grinch called Monkey Bone that was yes. with a Tim Burton sort of friend, Henry Selleck. Yeah. Um, that was pretty outrageous and also I'm trying to think for some reason I had to do a cast they did a cast I used to, they did a cast of my head in that too I think because I died or something or I think there was a dead me in there someplace but I don't remember we shot that at the same time it was a little bit of a blur of that but um yeah I interviewed um, the the animator of the original Grinch cartoon Phil Roman and uh oh. Oh, he was wonderful. He 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 actually turns ninety today. Today is his birthday. Wow! Yeah, that's amazing. Huh? Yeah, he says you know he cannot stand all this computer stuff and animation. Now he says there's there's nothing more magical than a brush and a piece of paper. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see where where things go because I I definitely have the same. Um. You know, I can appreciate technology, uh, but I also have a desire to pull back from it and just get just keep things real. Yeah, <laughs> so. same here. Do you get Do you get recognized for uh, the Grinch more than anything? Oh 
no, I don't get recognized at all for that because I had who like I had the makeup on. <laughs> I know, but like not even like your name, like oh, you're uh, been the Grinch stole Christmas, Mary Stein. No, I mean I did just the other day at the post office because those people know me, <clears throat> know me. And I have a PO box there, and she obviously put it together because I'm always getting Screen Actors Guild mail and stuff. But mm. um, yeah, so she she recognized me and was had just watched it and was very sweet. But um, yeah, not so much. It, it's not. I mean, and some of that stuff, I mean, it was, still, it was a while ago. I mean, it's still alive, you know? I mean, it's still being viewed a lot, but, um, yeah, not so much. I'm trying to think. I mean, around the time of Babe, people bizarrely recognized me from that because I had that, you know, strange little haircut and stuff. But, um, yeah, I don't know. But people recognize me, but they don't always know where from. You know, I get mm -hmm. a lot of head turns, but because I'm a character actor, they can't always, you know, figure out where. Yeah. <laughs> they know me from. <laughs> and then the other thing is I've done so many commercials and stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, and most of the commercials that I've done, you know, it's kind of just me or, you know, I, I'm pretty, like my face is very, um, has a lot of plasticity. It's very expressive. So yeah. my face was used in a lot of commercials, is all I would say. Yeah. <laughs> How was working on the last season of Providence? Um, first of all, I was thrilled to be on that show. Yeah. I mean... I love that show. That was, yeah, it was just so sweet. And, um, you know, it was just, I, I love doing things that are a bit different that I haven't done before and um, yeah that was really fun and um, the writers created that character and um, I was a um, candy striper that drove her nuts the lead and that was super fun and um, anyway, it, they set it in an ER to up the stakes they, were, they, they basically were trying to create new and improve show of Providence and um, it got really high ratings. They brought me in and um, another guy as an ER doctor and um, mm. yeah, and they got hot. the ratings went way up and, but what happened is the new, I think it was a new head of the studio, it was NBC and um, he just cleaned house. He just let it go and yeah. the fans went nuts because they were furious. They loved that show. And, um, but he replaced it with, um, who is Barbara Streisand's husband? Ryan O'Neill. Or not Ryan O'Neill, no, no, no. James no, no, Brolin. No, right. Yeah. So Brolin, his son, had a show that replaced that show. Do you know who oh, I mean? Oh, Josh Brolin, yeah. Josh I, Brolin did. He's a fabulous actor. I hadn't really, I didn't know him at the time, but anyway, whatever. It was, it was sort of political. But anyway, the show ended up going after just that one season, so which was like heartbreaking. But um, the way it goes, but I, I felt lucky to be on it. And yeah. the producers were super nice, and the writers, I loved them. They were great. It was a very good show, absolutely. I was reading that uh, you're an advocate for uh, abused kids and leukemia research. What made you get into those causes? Well, I have, um, gosh, I guess I have, um, it's not leukemia research. I just did, uh, there is a um, triathlon to raise money for leukemia. Um, so I did that because of my interest in athletics and just um, pairing that with, um, fundraising. So I just picked that um, sort of out of a hat because they they do these triathlons and I just wanted to be able to use that, you know, the athletic sort of training as a way to raise money. So I did that. But um, the Abuse Kids is um, it's a pet peeve. Of, I mean, just they're so um, yeah. vulnerable and they have no voice. I mean, I, I started... Um, actually, I was a big sister to um, these kids that lived in a home in Westchester. They were all kids that, um, I guess they, they were between being in foster homes or whatever, but they had been abused or their parents had been cokeheads or whatever. 
I started there and then um, I, I worked with those kids for a while and then I, um, uh, I had, like, after I was, like, in Australia for a while, I, um, you know, it was a little challenging for me down there because, um, you know, I was out of the country and there weren't a lot of people that I knew down there. And when I came back, I was just, like, kind of rebuilding my life because I was away for so long. And one thing I wanted to do is look at where I could give back. And um, I had seen on the news <laughs> Sister Janet, who was the head of a program called Inside Out down at Central Juvenile Hall mm-hmm. um, in L.A. Um, I saw her um, on the news along with there's another guy who's actually there's a bunch of people in the industry that are involved with this group called Inside Out. It's all about getting them to write and bring the inside their what's inside them out and then also to get what's going on inside Central Ju- Juvenile Hall out to the public so that people understand um, these kids that are being um, forgotten really and um, locked up and um, just that their stories are, are known. But anyway, so I um, I called down there and I, was, I asked to become involved. And the first time I went, I um, it was horrifying, actually, to me, because um, these are a lot of gang guys and stuff. And um, mm-hmm. I got really scared because of the intensity of, like, just like, I was like, I don't think I can do this. And then my, my cousin, who was a nun, convinced me to go back and work with the gang girls. So I did that. I did that for about nine months, but it was really challenging. That, I, felt, I always felt every every time I um, set foot in the place, it was challenging, but I always felt like I had a really strong purpose, and I felt, you know, mm-hmm. sort of needed. Although, in retrospect, I think I was really naive and um, <laughs> like kind of stupid, basically. <laughs> like, I... I you know, I just needed way more training before I stepped into that environment. Um, but my um, hmm. intention was pure. You know, I was doing the best I could to try to help out. And I think yeah. I did help a couple couple people out. But, um, yeah, I just think uh, I probably would not do that if I went back. <laughs> I don't, you know, I, yeah. But um, I do find the underdog and children and um, you know the people that feel like they don't belong I, um, and are uh, um, yeah abused I just yeah you know, my heart is open and um, that is wonderful I'll, I'll help try to try to give voice so. that is so wonderful I am a big big believer in altruism and it's it's uh, lacking in, in today's world, I feel, you know, and then, you know, when someone does have a big heart and wants to help people and stuff, there's always people questioning their motive, and it's just, it's 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 awful, I, I think. Yeah, we're definitely in strange times. I mean, it, I think it has to do with um, everything revolving around money, really, and <sighs> um, yeah. the economy, as opposed to people. I mean, it really just needs to get back to, you know, respect for human life. I mean, I feel like tearing up right now, I'm, and I mean, it's true, I just, like, think, who was I listening to? It's just the whole thing, it just, there's such disrespect for human life and the brilliance of each individual's um, dignity and right to be alive and live well, and, um, yeah, it's... Um, so hopefully, hopefully we're hitting a wall and um, we're waking up. I just, I mean, it's for sure changing me. Uh, like everything, you know, because it ha- it's been a, it's been happening for a while. It's not all of a sudden. Although right now we're in the midst of, you know, more difficult times or more in your face times. Yeah. But, and <laughs> radical, but. Um, yeah, it's been happening for a while, and it has changed me. I mean, I am, like, I just look at who I am today compared to what I was when I was in my 20s, and it's just, like, I feel like I've lived multiple lifetimes, but my Same here. values, my values and um, choices are, you know, radical, 
very, very different from what who I used to be. And it's a good thing. But I think all of that is influenced. And I mean, part of why I moved to Atlanta is because I wanted a better quality of life and, um, and to be able to work in the business. And I'm still, I mean, my goal is to have my own production company and I do have a couple projects that I've cultivated for a, a, a few years. Um, although I was taking care of my dad for about three years, so that kind of took me off course and then the pandemic. But ultimately, yeah, it's like I, I think how can I create a culture that I want to live in, including a working culture, and that includes um, content that that is pro that culture. In other words, you know, to influence culture to a better place, but also actually as you create the work that that environment is a culture, do you know? Mm-hmm. As, um, but anyway, that's my, that's my, my <laughs> um, creative journey right now. It's trying to, I mean, I'm still, like, I'm working on a project in the new year and I just, um, I mean, I'm working on things um, that are studio things, but, mm-hmm. um, and, and I'm grateful. And the, the thing that I'm about to do, I don't even know if I can really say it, but it's for Warner Brothers, but, um, yeah. I love the script. Oh my God, it makes me smile. It's so adorable. And um, I mean, they wouldn't characterize it that way, but it strikes me that way. It, but um, I just like it. But nonetheless, I I, um, I just want to subtly, for me, also do my own thing to cultivate this, um, yeah, humanity, <laughs> like dignity <laughs> through the work, you know, including for the people and how it, how it's brought about. Now, there are a lot of people in the industry, I'm not saying everybody, but there's definitely people that mm-hmm. have their finger on the pulse of that whole thing about, um, yeah, I mean, people are being very affected profoundly by what's been happening with our culture and humanity. And when I was in New York, um, Mary, uh, what's her name? She has a company. I was living for about a year up in Rhinebeck, and I was working out of New York, but mm-hmm. living up in Rhinebeck, which is about two hours north. She has a company up there called Stockade Works. Her name is Susan Fried Green Tomatoes. What's her name? Mary? Um, yeah. Mary Stewart Masterson. Masterson. Yeah. Yeah, Mary Stewart Masterson. But, um, yeah, because she was, like, working on a TV series down in, Brooklyn and had to, she would get on the train at like four in the morning or three in the morning up from up in the Hudson Valley and, you know, go in every day. She had like, I don't know, four kids. But, um, so people are just trying to find ways that they can live well, um, have a really good quality of life and create good content and do what they do, you know? Yeah, uh, that's, that's so great. Now, uh, going back to what you were saying before about your unusually long neck, um, is that a tra- trait? Is that a trait that's like passed on down to you? The long neck thing. I yeah. think my well, my mom has a, had a long neck, but I don't know that anybody had as long a neck as me. I think I've got that neck corners, that market corners. Um, that the kid in the Grinch had a really long neck too. He had a similar thing going on, but um, yeah, no. Um, just the height. Height was passed down, probably, and blue eyes and light skin. (laughs) I went on a blind date 11 years ago with a girl who had no neck uh, from a rare condition she had. Um, Wow! Yeah, she... Okay, so we uh, we knew about each other uh, from around town. We went to different schools, and... um, I, I had known that she had been in a wheelchair, like, when she was a kid, and then she wasn't anymore by the time we got to our 20s, and so I go on this blind date with her, and she was, like, mentally very immature, like, maybe still, like, five years old because of her condition, but it, unbelievably smart, but it was really scary, though, because you'd ask her a question, and it would be maybe 10 sentences before she answered the question, it was bizarre. Yeah. So then, um, 
because cause I was dating so much during that time and stuff, you know. I mean, I, I, I liked her, but I felt bad for her and everything. But I, I, I called everything off after that, that date. And uh, she was she started stalking me and, like, messaging my friends and my, um, my family and stuff. It was really bizarre. And then, ironically, a couple, uh-huh. two years later, I became friends with her brother without even knowing it. And I told him what happened and stuff. And he's like, yeah, you're not the only one. She does that to everybody. And then... Yeah, um, she probably felt desperate. Do you know what I mean? Like yes. She got a little attention and then she felt desperate. Yes. And now we're Facebook friends again. And she does not bother me at all. Uh, hopefully she's grown out of it or she's fa- found new people to stalk. But we are Facebook friends again because she made a, another account. And she's been good. It's been five years. So... That's funny. Yeah, I have the... the I'm very protective of my Facebook or any of my media. I'm not, I, I had a period where I was being stalked a bit and I, mm-hmm. um, so I'm very protective of all my information, all my social media. I'm not really out there that much. And, um, but nonetheless, I did have an old boyfriend who totally trashed me, who wanted to be a friend and for some reason I allowed it. We've actually become really good friends he's married he actually apologized to me like we had i mean it's wild i mean facebook has some weird stuff about it but it also like that was so profound to have somebody that had been so awful to me in the past and i was just a kid (laughs) and this is like literally when i was like 18 Mm -hmm. and um yeah, it's like he, I mean, this, his apology was like freaking amazing. And um, <laughs> yeah, it's really healing. So uh, there's good things about this place. It's like, <laughs> and surprising things. Like, yeah, I, I, all the time I was like, why did I even let this guy back? It, you know, but, um, but it revealed itself. Why? Because that was an extraordinary, I mean, it's been an extraordinary experience, so. Well, I hope you don't mind I sent you a friend request. <laughs> Aww, that's sweet. Oh, yeah, I see all the groundlings we know, like Lynn and Phyllis, and, um... That's who I thought you were talking about was Phyllis. Phyllis, yeah. Oh, she's wonderful. Oh, Sarah, Sarah Ballantyne. Oh, my God, I adore her. Was she a groundling? She wasn't a groundling, no, but I see that uh, the mutual friends list here. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Kate McGregor Stewart. Oh, I adore her, too. I don't actually know her that well. I know of her, so it's kind of interesting. Hopefully, at some point, I'll meet her. Oh, yes. She is hilarious. She's, like, brutally honest, and she's just, she has no filter. She's awesome. I I adore her. She just recorded a plug uh, for my show uh, recently, and I... I think I, I think I used it the other day, as a matter of fact. That's Yes. So there's this um, secret silly game that I like to play with my guests, Mary. And <laughs> this is a series of silly slumber party questions. It's just pure Uh-oh. fun. No right or wrong, just pure fun. And how this works is I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me the exact same question, and I answer it. I ask a question, Mm -hmm. you answer it, and then ask me that exact same question, and I answer it. Okay. Okay. I'll try. Yes. And uh, you can comment on answers, too. Okay. Okay. Mary, are you ticklish? Yes. Um, Tommy, are you ticklish? Yes. I've been known to hit some people in the groin. I'm so ticklish. (laughs) (laughs) Knee-jerk reaction. Um, what's your favorite part of the body? It could be anything. I don't know. The first thing that came up was lips, but then eyes. Uh, what's your favorite part of the body, Tommy? It can be anything. <laughs> I get those all the time. Um, my favorite is the belly button. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, yes. I've always been that way my whole life. Um, what color are your toes painted? They're not. What color are your toes painted? Same here. They are au naturel. (laughs) 
Um, what would you say is your best personality trait? Um, I guess honesty and authenticity. What's your best personality trait? I have empathy and no filter. Huh. That's good. Yes. And then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? So many. <laughs> how about how about the nearest one? <laughs> um, rotten bananas in a car. That oh god, that is bad. How about you? Uh, either farts or dirty feet. <laughs> I told that to uh, Kate, right? And do you know what she said? She said that should be the name of your memoir. <laughs> Yeah, she's hilarious. Well, Mary, I thank you so much for coming on today. I hope you had fun with this. Yes, thank you for um, inviting me. I hope um, I did you something that uh, will inspire people to come and see movies. And, um, yeah, that's it. You're very deep and insightful. And uh, real quick, I mean, do you have anything that's uh, going to be released anytime soon? Geico commercial probably in the new year and um, I did uh, I did an episode of the haves and the have nots and then like I said I'm shooting something um, in the beginning of the year but I don't think I can speak about it it's going to be coming out around March it's just a guest star on a TV series so wonderful wonderful well please stay safe because we need wonderful people like you in this world and oh I just want to assure you also that mm -hmm. um I'm going to St. George Island, but it's very safe. It's all, like, very quarantined and PC, so. Oh, I love it. Well, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and a great rest of your day. Okay, you too. Take care, Tommy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Mary Stein. Ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, what a lovely lady she is. And it was great having her on the show today. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Till next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes. Da, 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 the Grinch. <laughs> <laughs>